Good morning. Thank you for joining our Passport to 2044 session on TOD and centers. I'm Maggie Moore. I am a planner in the growth management group at the Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, and today's event is really focused on transit oriented development and centers. We have this is one in this our Passport to 2044 series. Um, so we've held eight events so far this year. We had a kickoff event back in June with presenters from PSRC, the Department of Commerce, and MRSC. We've also held other events on housing and equity, planning for critical areas. All of those, the recordings for the, those events, as well as the materials, are available on our website. Um, we're really excited for events we're holding in 2023. So we are planning for an, one on housing need and capacity in February in partnership with the Department of Commerce. Um, we're also planning for one on equity assessment tools and data in 2023, as well as one specifically for elected officials and planning commissioners to attend um, and learn about what's happening in the com comprehensive plans as well as their role in that process. So stay on the lookout for information on the dates for those as well as links to registration. But for today and our event focus on transit oriented development and centers, um, after we go through some introductory remarks, we're going to be talking about incorporating TOD into your local comprehensive plans. We'll also talk about centers and sub area planning. So we at PSRC today are joined by staff from Sound Transit to talk about their model code partnership, as well as staff from the city of Brenton to talk about their sub area planning work. Um, and at the end of today, we'll talk more specifically about regionally designated centers. So if you have a regionally designated center or you're thinking about having one in the future, that will really be the time to learn more about the requirements of planning for those, how that fits into your local comprehensive plan, and what we'll be looking for into 2025 on them. We'll also have opportunity for Q&A today. So if you have any questions throughout the, today's event, please add them into the Q&A on Zoom. Um, and we'll ask those all as a group and be able to answer them. Um, also, we are recording today's event. So that recording will be available online um, later this week, as well as the presentation. So if there are links within the presentation, you'll be able to access those on PSRC's website. And we'll also send an email out to everyone who registered that includes those presentations as well as the recording. We're also hoping that you can stick around Till the very end, we have a survey that should pop up via Zoom um, after the webinar, which is asking a few demographic questions. This is to fulfill some of our Title VI requirements. We really want an understanding of who is joining our event and who's engaging with us. So uh, PSRC is holding these Passport to 2044 events, as well as providing guidance and resources to really help you all in creating local plans that advance regional goals. So the Adopted Vision 2050 has um, regional goals that have been adopted in these key policy themes, which are probably pretty similar to some of the things you've been thinking about in your communities as you're working on your comprehensive plan updates. Um, so just to highlight a couple of these, uh, the first, increasing housing choices and affordability, uh, significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and then really um, on, on, on theme with today's event, growing in centers and near transit. So I think most people on this call are most likely planners who really understand the benefits of centers and TOD. I think the goal and the development patterns of Vision 2050 says this really well, that transit communities are healthy, walkable, compact and equitable areas that maintain local culture and help to conserve rural areas and preserve open space. And mixed use centers offer a diverse collection of services, mobility options, housing and jobs for the region's residents and developing around the region's transit network connects them together and increases access to services and jobs for residents throughout the region. And the regional growth strategy designates centers and TOD areas to be equipped to accommodate greater shares of future population and employment growth allowing more residents to have access to the range of opportunities available in these central places, including new mobility options as the regional high capacity transit network expands. So later today, I'll talk more specifically about the, what the regional growth strategy says about um, transit station areas, um, as well as that expansion of the high capacity transit network. 
But first, just overviewing some resources we have available from PSRC on Vision 2050. A great place to start is by looking at our plan review manual, which includes a consistency tool to really um, understand what's new in Vision 2050, what PSRC is looking for when doing plan review, and what some key focus areas are. Um, we also have a webinar we recorded in June 2021 that goes over that plan review manual and the consistency tool. And as I mentioned, we have all of our past webinars from the Passport series available on our website. We also have a variety of other guidance and resource documents. Um, some to highlight on this list are uh, guidance on equitable community engagement, as well as guidance on TOD and centers. Uh, we just released our draft housing element guide, so that is good to check out and is on there, um, as well as our planning resources page includes a lot of other resources and guidance documents, um, and we're continuing to work on more of those. So um, we are going to jump into today's event. The first presentation is on incorporating TOD into comprehensive plans. Uh, and to start us off, I'm interested for those on the call, we have another poll question for you. So we're hoping to learn um, what high capacity transit your community has today. Great, and I'm going to take a few seconds to wait while those responses come in to get an understanding of what people have today in their communities. All right, and to avoid an issue with the poll questions, Michaela, do you mind ending that poll and then sharing the results with everyone? So it looks like um, the most popular option on here is bus rapid transit in communities. Um, there's also some communities with light rail, streetcar, ferry, commuter rail, and some communities that don't have any high capacity transit today. We're going to move on to our next question, um, which is, is your jurisdiction planning for high capacity transit by 2044? So when you're thinking about your comprehensive plan and the planning you're doing in there, is there high capacity transit um, that you're planning for? Great. Thank you all for responding to that question. Makila, do you mind ending that poll and sharing the results? It looks like a lot of people are planning for bus rapid transit. That makes sense. There are huge expansions in our BRT system throughout the region and a lot also planning for light rail. Um, and then we have some of the other modes represented as well. That's great to see. Thank you so much. So um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the relationship be or what Vision 2050 says about transit oriented development. So talk about some key elements of TOD and considerations to take while planning for it in your community, in your comprehensive plan updates. And then, as I mentioned, we have presenters from Sound Transit and the City of Brenton um, to talk about their work as well. But before we get started, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with some shared definitions. So, and these are definitions that we use in Vision 2050. So when we're talking about high capacity transit, or sometimes we say HCT, we're talking about light rail, streetcar, commuter train, ferries, and bus rapid transit. When we're talking about high capacity transit station areas, we're talking about the areas within a half mile of existing or planned light rail and streetcar stations, commuter rail stations, ferry terminals, and within a quarter mile of bus rapid transit. And then when we're talking about transit oriented development, we're talking about more than the transit itself and the transit station, we're really talking about the development of housing, commercial space, services, and job opportunities near that transit service. Um, so it's much more than the area right around it. It's all of that development that encompasses that community that's um, being created around transit. Um, also, to kind of get us on the same page when we're talking about centers, so centers mean a bunch of different things. So um, the one we probably talk about the most at PSRC are our regionally designated centers. 
So this is what Liz is going to be presenting on later today, um, but just to make sure we have a shared definition, this includes regional growth centers, which are locations of compact pedestrian oriented development with a mix of housing, jobs, retail services, and other destinations. Includes manufacturing industrial centers, which are areas where regionally significant manufacturing and industrial land uses are concentrated and preserved. And then there are also countywide designated centers. So these vary by county of what the criteria includes. Um, but their countywide growth centers serve as compact mixed use development within a city or unincorporated urban area. And these areas are a local planning and investment priority and provide transportation options. Then there are countywide industrial centers, which serve as important local industrial areas within a city or unincorporated urban area. These areas are a local planning and investment priority to support industrial sector employment. And then we have other types of places and designations. So there are local centers, which are locally identified areas that play an important role in the region and help define community character, provide local gathering places, serve as community hubs and accommodate growth. And then while high capacity transit could be in any of these other types of centers, um, there are also other high capacity transit areas that aren't designated as centers. And so these are places within walking distance of high capacity transit stations where compact mixed use development patterns can support frequent transit service. So as I mentioned, Liz will talk more about those PSRC designated centers later today. Um, and that countywide designation really happens at the county level. Uh, so I also want to talk about um, something I think we all know is that the high capacity transit system in our region is expanding. So by 2050, there are 36 planned BRT routes. This really makes sense when we look at those numbers of who's joining us today and what types of transit you're planning for. BRT um, will be in many different communities in all four counties. Also have um, 10 passenger only ferry routes and five light rail routes. So those will connect to Tacoma, Issaquah, Redmond, and Everett. Really want to say here that you know um, in your community how important what's coming online is um, and really what's best for those station areas and who they're serving and how they're serving them. Um, so we ag really acknowledge that, that all cases are different in all of those station areas. We really want to talk about how it fits into regional goals around growth. Um, and to talk about that and what Vision says about transit-oriented development. So the regional growth strategy has 65% of population growth and 75% of employment growth um, going to regional growth centers and high-capacity transit station areas. So this is really frames a lot of this work around centers and TOD that we'll be talking about. Um, and looking at current trends between 2018 and 2020, over half of population growth was near high capacity transit. Um, so we know that these places are already attracting um, that growth. Uh, so this is really about planning for that development and TOD around those transit stations. And before I get started about specific recommendations um, of planning for stations, uh, I want to share some resources from PSRC. So the first is that we have a regional TOD committee. Um, and this is a TOD committee made up of members throughout our region. As all of PSRC's committee meetings, these are open to the public. So you are welcome to attend and see what's happening at the committee. The committee also has events, so they held a all-day TOD event back in October, which recordings are available for on our website. Um, and they'll also hold walking tours throughout the year of different station areas. We also have some resources available, so our Housing Innovations Program includes information on housing in centers and near transit. And we also have that uh, vision planning resource that I mentioned earlier on incorporating TOD into comprehensive plans. We have a quarterly newsletter called Talk in TOD, um, which you can sign up for. It includes information coming from PSRC on TOD, as well as what's happening throughout the region. It's a great way to kind of keep in touch with what's happening um, and uh, know what resources are coming out. So I'm going to dive into our section on planning for TOD. 
So this really includes different considerations to take um, when you have transit in your community and incorporation into local comprehensive plans. So the first we want to start with is defining your station area. So we really know that walkability should define transit station areas. Um, as I said, the, the definition and vision is that half mile or quarter mile buffer, but because research shows that people are willing to walk up to 10 minutes or half a mile for high capacity transit. But in reality, street grids and physical barriers such as topography or highways affect those walk sheds. Um, so you can see those examples. These examples are a little dated. So if these are your communities and they're not quite right right now, um, just keep that in mind. We know that these are dated. At one farthest on the left, um, I think it's a great example of that. This is Alderwood Mall and Linwood. So that black circle is the half mile buffer around that future light rail station. Um, and that brown area is what's been defined as the station area. So you can really see that the highways um, in that area are really defining that station area um, and where people can reasonably walk to to get to that light rail station. So we suggest taking all of this into account when defining station areas, but acknowledge that with additional street connections in the future or observed development patterns, station areas can also change over time. Um, and then the next, thinking back to that 65% of population growth and 75% of employment growth, um, really considering how stationary growth relates to your overall city or unincorporated area growth. So those numbers that you're currently planning for, we know that you know what's best in your community, um, but in general, transit provides opportunity for significant growth. So thinking about what transit stations areas you have, what's appropriate for growth based on mode or what current development patterns are around those areas. It's really important to consider context and what's around the transit station um, and what kind of development it's appropriate for. The next is with that growth coming online into those station areas, having a really good understanding of who's currently living and working in those areas and evaluating your transit station areas for potential physical, economic, and cultural displacement of both residents and businesses. So PSRC has a displacement risk mapping tool, which provides um, risk of displacement, residential displacement by census tract. So that's a great resource we have on our website. Uh, we're, also, we're also developing equity guidance for comprehensive plans, which will include some information on commercial displacement. A great example of this is from the Bothell Canyon Park sub area plan which recognize the importance of local immigrant and people of color owned businesses as places for social connection and economic opportunities. Um, so they are planning for flexible and low rent spaces, which allow for diverse and community serving businesses. So in this planning process, they really worked with um, existing local businesses, small business owners and future business owners to understand what they would need for their businesses in their communities. Uh, the next one, supporting transportation projects, this one's really about money and funding. So at the regional level, PSRC funding is prioritized to centers, but the county and local level, there's opportunity for funding for high capacity transit station areas. So more than just those regionally designated centers. Um, it's also important at the local level as you're developing your comprehensive plan to incorporate multimodal projects that support transit access into your transportation element. So showing that those are um, local priorities so then they can also be county and regional priorities as well. A great way to assess kind of what that multi what those multimodal improvements may be. Um, one resource we have from PSRC is our transit access checklists and toolkit. This checklist really provides a great opportunity to assess existing or existing or future transit station areas. Um, so really understanding the data and conditions on the ground of those station areas. Um, and then the toolkit provides um, uh, strategies to put into place to address those. 
So really the findings from this, um, the first is that context matters for improving access. All station areas are different and really looking at them all specifically um, and how they're, what development patterns are currently around them and how people are using that transit is really important. The next is that roles aren't always clear for delivering access improvement. So this is where it's really important to be working with any partners you have, including transit agencies, to understand who will be providing improvements, um, be, either so they do happen or so that they're not happening overlapping. Um, not everyone's doing the same improvements. So really coordination is key when providing transit access um, and thinking about these multimodal projects. Uh, we're also really encouraging sub-area planning. So um, encouraging considering developing a separate sub-area plan that includes specific goals for land use, housing, transportation, and economic development. Liz will talk about requirements for sub-area planning for regionally designated centers, but you don't have to be a regionally designated center to do a sub-area plan for a station area. Um, and a great way to do this is to include policies and actions in your comprehensive plan to support future sub-area planning work. So we've included some examples here. The Sumner Town Center plan is a recent sub-area plan around a commuter rail station. Um, as well as their current planning efforts around Snohomish County light rail communities, as well as multiple station areas in the city of Bellevue. And they mentioned the city of Brenton will be talking about their sub area planning work um, later this morning. Uh, it's also important to consider the role of local transit. So additional transit in the region, including frequent and local bus service, also provides valuable connections. Local bus service and other mobility options link residents to the regional high capacity transit network and to local destinations, supporting all types of transit by making it attractive to use and providing safe and convenient options for walking and biking, give more residents affordable and sustainable access to jobs and services throughout the region. Local transit nodes can also be great places for development. So many of the same considerations that we've mentioned throughout this presentation can also be applied to additional modes. So it doesn't just have to be that those high capacity transit modes. Um, it's also important that while many transit station areas serve as ideal locations for growth and development, not all will play a role in accommodating significant growth. You really know what's best in your communities. Um, for example, some high capacity transit station areas are in rural areas. We know these provide important connections to urban areas, but are not appropriate for the same level of growth as stations located in the urban growth area. Um, so other stations will be access points to the regional system, but may not be appropriate for that growth and development. Also important, as I mentioned, to work with uh, your transit agencies. So this can really benefit communities and align your interests and investments. Um, and it also can identify future supportive transit events, investments um, and other opportunities for partnership around those uh, multimodal improvements um, and also the availability of surplus public land. So really taking as much advantage as possible of that future transit network. So this provides a really good opportunity for me to transition to Sound Transit's presentation. So I'm going to pass it to Miranda Redinger, the High Capacity Transit Senior Project Manager from Sound Transit. Great, thanks Maggie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll introduce myself while Maggie's pulling up the PowerPoint. Um, looking at the attendee list, many of you uh, I have worked with or am currently working with. So good to see you all here. Uh, I am a senior project manager working on the Everett Link Extension Project and managing the Model Code Partnership, which is a component of that project. Uh, spent the previous 12 years, I started at Sound Transit in 2019. And the 12 years prior to that, I worked for the city of Shoreline as a land use planner, where I did a comp plan update and multiple sub area plans, including two light rail station sub-area plans. Uh, also want to quickly introduce or have Juan call off, my colleague at Sound Transit, introduce himself. He'll be available for questions later and he'll be popping some resources into the chat during this presentation. Juan? Yeah, hi, thanks Miranda. I'm Juan Calaf, I'm a senior land use 
planner with Sound Transit, and I'm also involved in the model code partnership effort as well for the Everett Link Extension project. And I have also been working in stationary planning for both the Everett Link Extension and for Stride projects. Thanks. Great, thanks. Okay, go on with the first slide. So this is this is context. This is the Sound Transit District, and I would imagine the majority of people on this call are uh, within this district. Uh, over three million people uh, in this area, three counties, fifty-two cities, expected to grow eight hundred thousand by twenty forty. If we were live in a room, I'd ask you to raise your hand um, if you're within this ta taxing district or one of these cities or counties. Uh, but I, I believe that function's been disabled. But according to the poll earlier with 47% with of you anticipating light rail transit, I would imagine um, this, this is a lot of you, but I also um, want to make this relatable for folks who maybe aren't planning for light rail transit. As, as someone mentioned earlier, it was in Maggie's presentation as well. Uh, high capacity transit can mean a variety of things. So we're working um, with Snohomish County and some jurisdictions up there will be focused on developing policies and regulations that would work for them, uh, that they may consider locally for adoption into comprehensive or sub area plans or regulatory packages. But it could work just as well, you know, where I live here in Bremerton, high capacity transit uh, can mean ferry. So we, we hope that a lot of the work that we're doing, you would find uh, relevant to, to what you're planning for in your jurisdiction. Next slide. Here is a more zoomed in map, uh, specifically of the projects that we are currently working on. Uh, many of those came from a funding package called ST2 that is, uh, has 28 stations under consideration opening in the next few years, and it will nearly triple the service uh, that currently exists. And then we have uh, Sound Transit 3 PUT funding package, which is a 252 mile network that will connect the entire region and we'll, at the end of the day, we'll have 116 miles of link light rail, 91 miles of sound or commuter rail, and 45 miles of BRT. Next slide. And this one is just a little bit of context. Like I said, if you're in one of those jurisdictions that we typically work with, um, we kind of divide uh, responsibility based on these zones. So the station itself is usually sound transit, uh, you know, design, we've got standards, uh, that's all of the, the mechanisms that make the station itself work. The station context, which is the area, you know, kind of the transition zone, that's a collaborative space where we work closely with the partners. And then usually the station area, that half mile radius around the station, is usually under the purview of, of partners and, and local land use. And the model code partnership that I'm going to talk about kind of blurs that line a bit. It, it provides um, a resource that Sound Transit's bringing to the table to support TOD in those areas as well in the full station sub area. So it ends up being kind of a big umbrella, uh, but it definitely expands that collaborative space. Next slide, and then you can go past the... Uh, so little orientation to Everett Link Extension. Uh, it is a 16 mile extension. There are six stations, including one provisional station there you see kind of uh, blurred out there, SR99 and Airport Road. Provisional means it is not funded for uh, construction. So we're gonna, we're taking uh, that station through the alternatives design process that we're taking the rest of the stations through. We'll take it through environmental review, uh, but at some point we will not have the money to construct that along with the rest of the alignment. This uh, extension also includes an operations and maintenance facility. This is roughly 60 to 70 acre site that is uh, very integral to the project. It is a, it's not an a la carte uh, uh, selection that you could make. We're hoping to open that by 2034 because it will also serve some of the other extensions, but that's where all the trains go every night to be cleaned. Uh, they're tested before they begin service um, and, and any number of other things that are very critical to operating the system. The Everett Link extension, we project to be somewhere between 37,000 and 45,000 riders by 2040. And the start of service, ideally for the whole line all the way up to Everett Station is 2037. We are currently looking at an affordability gap and uh, worst case scenario, if we cannot close it, then we'll get as far as Southwest Industrial Center by 2037, then we'll complete the spine to Everett Station by 2041. Next slide. 
Uh, just want to be clear, we are currently in the planning phase. Uh, we get a lot of questions about why exactly this takes so long to build, um, but it does take about 15 years to go from, from planning through uh, start of service. We are at the beginning of that. Um, we're in the alternatives development phase where we really take what the voters approved and, and dig into the details, do a lot of analysis to really figure out where those stations should land, where the alignments should go. Then um, hopefully mid next year, we'll enter into the environmental review process, beginning with the draft uh, environmental impact statement. Then we'll move into design, construction, testing, and then start of service. Next, keep going. So that brings us to the main topic today, which is the Federal Transit Administration's Transit Oriented Development Pilot Program Grant. We were awarded, Sun Transit was awarded $2 million in December of 2020. And the partners you see there on the right, uh, Everett Linwood, Snohomish County, PSRC. And I will note that it was actually the partners who suggested that Sound Transit apply for the grant because the transit agency needed to be the grant recipient working in partnership with the locals. But the point is that the FTA, Sound Transit, all the jurisdictions, and I would imagine all of you um, would really like to support the, the five topics here that are kind of uh, of common interest. So TOD, multimodal connectivity, public private partnerships, economic development, uh, preservation, creation of affordable housing. Next slide. And these are really um, intended to be, the FTA grant is really intended to adopt best practices throughout a whole corridor rather than just in individual station areas. So some of the goals that we have are to align the standards for design of a linear system through multiple jurisdictions. I'll show some examples of how that can, can make it, can be tricky uh, with one system through multiple permit agencies. We also, um, the bullets on the last slide were common agency and partner interests. And we're interested in, in all of those things and supporting all of those efforts for the full station areas. And then we also, you know, are looking to, to uh, avoid some problems that we've had in the past to really apply those lessons learned for when local jurisdictions you know, have never permitted light rail before and maybe their codes aren't written for it. Maybe when they're talking about you know, transit stations, what they need is, is bus shelters. Um, so you know, making sure that the codes uh, are, are prepared for a sound transit to come through and that we can streamline those permitting processes and increase predictability for all partners, including any developers of TOD that would be interested in coming to those areas. Next slide. So this is just a high level process slide, um, not to get too far into the weeds of, of this, but there's a couple of points here. Uh, the, the first line across the top is, is the components of the model code partnership project. I'll talk more about each of those, but the, the, to date we have done a fair amount of prerequisite work, uh, some of which we think will be relevant you know, for other jurisdictions and we'll make those available in the chat. Um, then we're pivoting into what will be the rest and the, the kind of the really important deliverable that again, you know, we think could be useful to, to folks outside of Snohomish County as well. And that's development of model code and then supporting the jurisdictions through local adoption. The FTA grant period, as I mentioned, started at the end of 2020, goes all the way through 2024. And that was intentional uh, because of the comp plan adoption cycle. Most of our jurisdictions are doing comp plans and sub area plans. Um, so wanted to be available as a resource throughout that whole period. Uh, as I mentioned, we're currently wrapping up or we're you know, round in the corner, probably more like Q2. Um, next year, we'll wrap up the phase one alternative development phase. We'll move into phase two, the draft EIS phase. Um, and our contract uh, to work on the model code is through our EverLink uh, extension contract consultants. Lastly, the, the significance of that last bullet is just to say that Sound Transit will not have um, a public engagement plan per se for the model code effort because all of the policies and regulations will be adopted through local jurisdictions, especially uh, for comp and sub area plans. They'll be having their own engagement processes. So we're trying to coordinate that. We're trying to make sure that um, we can each have a presence at each other's meetings just to try to avoid uh, public meeting fatigue and confusion about roles. But for instance, you're not gonna be able to go to the Sound Transit webpage and find uh, the TOD case studies report. Um, we will have that 
like I said, available for those of you that are interested, but we are working through the local jurisdictions for uh, the engagement planning around these efforts. Next slide. Here are the elements of the model code. I'll talk just briefly about what that means. Um, first, we started with an inventory. We started um, by reading through all of the policy documents and all of the regulatory documents. And this is available. It's about a thousand pages for folks who are being introduced to this model code partnership project. I don't recommend that they start with reviewing the uh, policies and regulations in inventory. That's only for hardcore policy wonks. I would imagine there are several of us on the call here today. Uh, the gap analysis, I think, starts to become more relevant to outside audiences, and I'll define the gaps um, that we identified in order to, to create this report. So gap one is the gap between a jurisdiction's own policy and regulation. That's when, for example, you, you see a comp plan policy and it says develop incentives for affordable housing. And then you go to the regulations to the development code and the, those incentives have not yet been codified. So that's gap one. Uh, gap two is gap between jurisdictions. And this goes back to that, you know, designing a system that will be permitted from multiple agencies. So what version of the Department of Ecology LID stormwater manual they're using becomes relevant. Uh, sure makes it easier if everybody is at least working from the same uh, stormwater manual. Gap three is the gap between best practices and existing regulations. So, you know, in order to measure this gap, we developed a set of TOD principles, um, and I'll go through those later. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, we want to avoid permitting conflicts with sound transit facilities to the extent that we can forecast what, what some of those might be. Then we moved into a TOD case studies report. Um, this, is, this is the prettiest of the reports. It is intended for a, a much wider audience. Um, but we looked at similar planning efforts in peer cities. We also developed economic considerations and financial tools. And then, as I mentioned, we're, we're moving into this final phase uh, to develop model code. And we have, a, as, as I said, a big umbrella of, of stuff that we can look at under there. Next. Keep going. Yeah, this one um, I'll just touch on briefly. It's just to note that we looked at comprehensive plans, sub area plans, master plans, including climate action plans. We looked at municipal and development codes. And like I said, this is very specific to the three jurisdictions in the Everett Link Extension. Um, but if anybody's really dying, dying to look at this, we can make it available. Keep going. And I also talked about what these gaps are, so I won't go through that again. Um, next slide. Here are the TUD principles that we developed with Juan and his team. And, you know, there, each of these has sub principles, but, you know, if folks are interested, we can talk more about that or Juan's here to answer any questions that people might have if you want to unpack this a bit. We also realized, go to the next slide, that these TOD principles um, are not the same as comprehensive plan elements. So as we move forward in the model code package, we're kind of reframeworking, reformatting um, what we had developed as TOD principles into things um, that could be filed rather or sorted under uh, standard comp plan elements. And you know, those, those first five are mandated, uh, the second two are, are optional under GMA, but most everyone has them. And then there's some customization. Some jurisdictions have a natural environment, some have sustainability, climate action, some have community character or urban design elements. And we're, we're, we want to make sure that there is a, a robust uh, selection of best practice options that will be useful for our local jurisdictions. Keep going. This is the case studies report. And I think Juan's gonna pop a link in the chat uh, for this in case, in case people are interested, but we did, uh, there are six case studies in this report. Half of them, three of them are corridor based, half of them are station specific. And in order to uh, select what case studies we, we dove into, uh, the jurisdictions had some advice for us. And they said, first of all, make it relevant. Um, you know, that means that there's some freeway adjacent stations that these are more suburban settings, you know, recognizing that uh, smaller jurisdictions have uh, less staff capacity to implement complex permitting systems. So, so they said, do not bring us 
examples of things that we just don't have the capacity to administer. They also said, you know, don't bring us things where, you know, we know what the best practice is, but the barrier is political or public will. We don't need to know more about right size parking. Obviously, we're going to have to address that in our comp and sub area plans. Um, but, but find examples of problems that we're really trying to solve here. Find uh, some anti displacement measures. Um, we also have thematic vignettes that are smaller areas, a lot to do with stormwater that might not be worth a full case study, but we thought were interesting things to kind of put on the table. Next slide. So we have of the corridor based case studies, we looked at Honolulu, San Jose, and St. Paul. Next slide. For the station specific case studies, we looked at Contra Costa, Denver, and Hillsborough. And for those of you that are familiar with some of these, you'll know that you know, Hillsboro was kind of the very origin of even defining what TOD meant. And you know, on the other hand, the Honolulu extension won't open until the 2030s. So we've got some case studies that we use that, that have had decades to you know, kind of play out. And so there's some lessons learned there about how did this work out in the way that you anticipated? You know, what did you need to amend over time? And then we've got some future focused um, kind of uh, examples to look at as well. Next, the thematic vignettes, uh, we're looking at some, some concepts like privately owned public spaces. And as I mentioned a lot with water, complete streets, stormwater parks, swales, shared stacked green infrastructure in the right of way when you are constrained. And then district energy combined heat and power basically uh, again, with 2037 station opening, we have to think more about how water and energy will be used at that time. Um, sure, there's, you know, we could have a whole different discussion about potential disruptive transportation, uh, you know, innovations, um, but we, we know at least that water and energy uh, are probably going to be of greater concern in the future. Keep going. And this one, the economic demand development and financial tools, keep going, uh, is something that was uh, requested in the FTA notice of funding availability. And because we had already done that inventory and we could customize for each individual jurisdiction, we knew what financial tools they had in use and what financial tools they may be interested in exploring. And you know, related to comp plans or sub area plans, these are you know, some of the when you're talking about capital facilities and utilities and you need to figure out how to fund them, the legend on the right shows kind of what, um, what the available funding source is intended to support. And obviously, you know, everybody's looking for money for housing, everybody's looking for money to expand roadways um, and hopefully, you know, make that infrastructure a little greener. Next slide. We also were aware that some of the funding mechanisms that we looked at in the case studies uh, we don't really have access to in Washington state. So for example, you know, Colorado, California, Hawaii, even Minnesota have, have more authority in terms of redevelopment agencies and districts. Um, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, Washington just got TIF light tax increment financing and everybody's struggling to figure out how they can implement this. And in some cases like the county, whether they can implement it. But this is something that, that could be useful uh, if you're interested in wanting to talk more uh, with your financial services and, and leadership about how you can get some of these initiatives that you plan for funded. Keep going. And now I will, um, you know, this is the final stretch here. We are, we are, I'm gonna share some examples of the types of things that we are working with our jurisdictions to develop as part of this model code package. And I'll note that, you know, by mid next year, we hope to have published a, a generic package of, of policies and regulations that could be used for local consideration. And anyone here is welcome to that resource. We'll then work specifically with cities of Linwood and Everett and Snohomish County to support them as they go through local adoption processes. And that could be support with, with studies. It could be engagement. Assistance, we're, I think, really going to lean into this anti displacement. Um, so, you'll see the, the example mentioned here a few times um, residential displacement, commercial displacement, and cultural displacement are things that we know everybody's struggling uh, to try to mitigate. And 
you know, what I have listed on, on this slide and the next are just our topics. And I think they're topics that you're likely talking about in your jurisdiction as well. And as someone who has both written and then implemented a lot of long range planning documents, uh, comp plan, separate plans and the like, um, you know, it's really important that verb really changes meaning when you go from writing it to implementing it. It's pretty, well, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it, it is easier to write a policy statement that says, you know, fund, develop a program, uh, and then you, you get it adopted and, and you turn the corner and you say, oh man, now we've got to fund and develop these programs. Um, so again, what we have here is topics, but they, they would be phrased in the form of a comp plan policy. And then later they could be codified as an actual regulation. But for land use, we're really talking a lot about zoning. This includes intensity, density, uses, design, um, how to support TOD and, you know, kind of throughout all of the elements. For housing, obviously, it's, it's choice and affordability. It's incentives like multifamily property tax exemption. It's mandates, uh, including inclusionary, inclusionary zoning. And again, we're looking at residential anti-displacement strategies here. For transportation, a lot of it's about multimodal infrastructure, complete streets. Uh, the thing that was of greatest interest to all of our local jurisdictions uh, in the Everett Link extension were street classifications, typologies, and cross sections. Say a little bit more about that later. Um, obviously, everybody needs to understand how to, how to right size the parking requirements and what parking reductions might be and what transportation demand management may look like. For capital facilities and utilities, uh, it's innovative solutions for stormwater, water, and sewer, public private partnerships, and other funding mechanisms. How do we how do we get this done, especially in that time frame, in that gap? between when everyone has done their EISs, Sound Transit's done the EIS, we understand you know, impacts and mitigations for the light rail system, the locals have done EISs, they understand impacts and mitigations of their, of their growth planning and growth scenarios. And, but the, the improvement, whether it's you know, additional BRT or light rail stations, there's a gap, but the market isn't really activated yet, especially the really high density stuff right around the, the station they're not paying for those upgrades yet. They're not even paying impact fees through permitting. So how, how do you get the infrastructure improvements funded and constructed before the stations open, before the traffic picks up, um, but really before the private market is, is contributing to that financially? Next slide. Uh, economic development, a lot of this is, is neighborhood serving businesses, everybody once them, I, I'm sure for those of you who have already done visioning work for your comp plan, you, you heard the same thing. You probably heard we want walkable communities with coffee shops and bookstores, um, but that neighborhood serving business, how do you promote them? How do you retain them? How do you create incubators? How do you um, avoid displacing current tenants uh, that are renting and, and may not be able to afford uh, to keep their space and, and, and keep their access to the community? How do you attract creative class? Um, parks and recreation, a lot of this is understanding impacts and mitigations of growth. How many more parks do you need? How many, um, I mean, even down to the, what, what school resources do you need? Uh, and what are strategies for funding? So do you wanna implement a park impact fee? Uh, what about public art? Then there's some categories that are optional of natural environment and or sustainability. And this a lot has to do with protecting critical areas and natural resources. How do you get to restoration? And then what climate action strategies might you consider? Combined heat and power, uh, LID for stormwater management, green building, and then the community character and urban design. How do you manage transition both in place and time? How do you, how do you transition from what will be high capacity uh, TOD near stations down to existing single, single family neighborhoods? Also, how do you transition over time? Do you phase your zoning? Um, you know, how, do, how, do you, how do you manage that whole process? Because that ends up being really important to, to the people that have to live through that change. Uh, do, you, do you wanna adopt design standards um, for buildings or streets or whatever? Um, how do you create partnerships with the community? How do you preserve and expand community services? Next slide. And I mentioned the station experience design guideline and Juan, if you wanna pop the link in the chat for that as well. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is fortuitous that at the same time that, 
you know, we're over here in the Everett Link project working with our partners uh, to, to go through the model code partnership process. Um, Sound Transit was also developing a station experience design guidelines uh, that we lovingly call the SEDGE. And this also includes multimodal access typologies and cross sections. And in terms of that, you know, consistency and, and, and streamlining, especially in the design process, um, you know, I mentioned the, the jurisdictions were very interested in these typologies and cross sections. And it, how amazing would it be if at the end of the day, you know, we, we had very similar street typologies and cross sections, and that would really help as we align our improvements with the ones that they're making uh, through transportation elements and CIPs and, and all of the other ways that, that transportation projects get built. Next slide. And then in closing, you know, I, Maggie mentioned that, you know, many of you who are working on comp plans and local jurisdictions, you know, maybe haven't, haven't done them before. And, you know, as someone who's, who's I did a comp plan in, in rural Virginia and, you know, suburban shoreline. And, you know, there's, there's things you're gonna run into. Uh, it, it potentially is talking about a lot of things that, that folks aren't necessarily comfortable with. And I uh, found this quote a long time ago when I was rezoning single family neighborhoods to high density mixed use. And, and you know, there, there were a lot of people that were really not happy about that. And um, I came across this slide and it just, it really spoke to me about how people feel when you come into their community and you start changing things um, and it's for a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks, its insides come out and everything changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, it would look like complete destruction. And so by working on comprehensive plans, you are all therefore agents of change. This is not always a comfortable position, but I'm, I want to just say, you know, it's, 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 it's important work and, um, and you can get there and there's resources to help. And I'm happy to be one of those resources. And with that, I will close. Let me look quickly in the chat to see. Um, we can talk more. I think we're gonna we're gonna have major Q and A after City of Renton's presentation, so we can get to some of these um, really good questions that you're putting in the chat a little bit later. And for now, I will kick it to Paul Hintz from City of Renton, and he can talk more about some of their efforts. So thank you very much. Thank you, Miranda. Uh, please give me one moment while I share my screen. Okay, so um, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Hintz here with Katie Buca Morales to share our work in developing the city of Renton's Rainier Grady Junction TOD sub area plan, which was adopted about a year ago. Um, this is the city's first TOD related work. And we're proud to note that the city received a Governor's Smart Communities Award uh, for the plan. For anyone unfamiliar with Renton, the city is located just south of Seattle and spans from Lake Washington and Newcastle in the north to Kent in the south, with most of our city limits bordering unincorporated King County. Shown on the map with the red outline is our uh, regional growth center, uh, which is, um, um, sorry, so on the, on the red outline is our city center community planning area, which is one of 10 community planning areas that cover the entirety of the city, uh, with uh, including our potential annexation areas. And then in the yellow, you can see our regional growth center. Our population surpassed 100,000 since our last conference plan update, and we are minor, minority majority city. Um, over half our residents work in either Seattle, Bellevue or Renton. And we are the eighth most populous city in the state and the fourth most in King County. We currently have over 43,000 housing units and over 60,000 jobs, but we expect to see those numbers increase soon based on pipeline projects that will be able to accommodate over 17,000 new residents and over 10,000 new jobs. We created the plan in response to new investments in public transit with the future creation of a new transit center at the corner of Rainier Avenue and Grady Way that will accommodate more buses and more riders. We also expect bus rapid transit service starting in 2024 that will provide fast arrivals and departures along with 10 minute service intervals during rush hour. 
And I'll hand it off to Katie here. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so here we have our first look at the TOD subarea boundary um, outlined here in black, uh, the boundary itself, which we'll look at with more context in an upcoming slide is based on a half mile radius surrounding the transit center, as well as some other staff identified carve outs based on our local knowledge of the area. Um, but Early on, we adopted core goals for the plan. The first goal was to create a vision which for a livable, distinct mixed income neighborhood. Uh, we really wanted this to be one that aligns with the overall vision for the city center comprehensive planning area that Paul just pointed out, and also uh, be complementary to the nearby downtown and Renton as a whole. We also wanted to prioritize developing conceptual strategies that would have the potential to transform the area into a pedestrian oriented district with a multimodal center with strong pedestrian connections. Um, also, as Paul mentioned, we initiated the planning process because of ongoing public investment in the area. So the plan itself is intended to continue to leverage ongoing public investments so that private investment will hopefully follow. And along that same vein, uh, the plan prioritizes identifying uh, those public investments, opportunities for improvements, and also identifying development regulations that will help support the community's vision for the area. <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and assume that most folks on the call are not familiar with the study area, um, but as shown here, it's a predominantly auto-centric, uh, particularly along Rainier and Grady with anywhere from four to six lane uh, wide roadways. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of underutilized parking. There are several car dealerships within our TOD boundary, um, some mid-scale office towers, both dine-in and fast food franchise type restaurants, uh, retail and businesses offering various uh, on-site services. <laughs> There's also a very small number of uh, dwelling units, except for just a handful of uh, legally non-conforming units that are just dispersed among some of the car dealerships. So the overhead power lines, uh, there's the overhead uh, power line corridor that crosses through the area that limit uh, development and uses on several of the parcels. Uh, this is one challenge that we're anticipating. Uh, the overhead power lines and the large poles that have tend to have a dominating visual presence and easements that are along the corridor also prevent uh, construction underneath or directly adjacent to the power lines. Uh, so really the easements themselves are reducing the total buildable area and um, this will have to be addressed through building setbacks and trying to identify other opportunities. A few things that we have considered so far have been utilizing portions of overhead utility corridor to provide for a bike or a trail corridor um, with smaller gathering outdoor spaces uh, planned along it. The map on the left includes the TOD subarea boundary and highlights some of the activity and investments surrounding and within it. Uh, this also helps illustrate the need to plan for growth and why planning for growth at this location. Um, our current transit center is located downtown, but expanded bus service and BRT are not viable at this location because of either geographic constraints. Um, also, there's not the same easy access on and off uh, for the highway. Also for context, uh, region, uh, Renton's regional growth center boundary as shown with the gray hatching spans from the area south of Lake Washington, capturing several areas of interest, um, including Southport and the Landing. Uh, they're two standalone, but very complementary mixed use districts with new retail and residential development. And then to the south, uh, the regional growth center also includes the downtown and a sizable area surrounding it. And then uh, you'll notice that the growth boundary only comprises or overlaps the very small segment of the TOD boundary, just barely overlapping with the sub areas uh, northeast boundary. And then I'll draw your attention to the, the pink catch lines and that depicts the current auto mill zoning overlay. 
which is located within our TOD subarea boundary and is in very close proximity to the future transit center. Um, historically, our autumn mall uh, area was relegated to the downtown until about 30 years ago when the city made the decision to adopt the autumn mall uh, zoning overlay as a strategy to maintain the historic character of downtown, relocate autumn mall businesses, and not lose uh, tax revenue associated with those auto sales. And I don't think we've mentioned this yet, but the future site of our transit center is actually at the former uh, Sound Fort site. Um, also of significance, we've mapped existing and future bus rapid transit routes, uh, the Sounder commuter rail spur um, in the nearby Tequila, and a preferred light rail site and potential light rail spur. And then in shown in the brighter purple is our plan action ordinance boundary, which is our current phase or focus of the TOD sub area implementation work. So we, we began our work at about the same time uh, as the pandemic was declared. And as a result, we had to pivot to conducting every meeting online, uh, but we actually feel that our public engagement was likely improved from a better turnout of targeted art audiences. Um, just the, the the ease of being able to get on your computer rather than have to go to a physical location, I think opened up that opportunity. Um, and our stakeholder work group actually included a couple of those car dealership owners that Katie mentioned. Um, it also included uh, the rented school district and our transit partners, Sound Transit, King County Metro and WashDOT, as well as owners of prominent area businesses and owners of property within the core area of the sub area. Uh, we also hosted three developer forums attended by both market rate and affordable housing developers. Um, as well as commercial and office developers. We had two goals for these forums, the first of which was to try and understand potential challenges uh, that developers may have in meeting the expectations of the plan's vision. And the second goal was to really get the word out among the development community about the future transit center and the willingness of the city to accommodate significant growth in the area. Uh, we had a great turnout during the three meetings with 20 participants representing 16 organizations. The plan itself is organized into four areas of focus, multimodal accessibility, land use, urban design, and health and equity. Our housing action plan was being developed concurrently, so we decided to let that document address citywide housing goals and methods to achieve them. Our plan does call for substantial housing that accommodates both affordable and market rate housing, but the only direct recommendation uh, from the plan is to allow multifamily housing tax exemption, which our city council did shortly after the plan was adopted. And this map here uh, broadly lays out the concept of the plan. I won't get into too much details here, but the focus of the plan is what we've dubbed the core in the Eastern portion with the orange and red colors. This area is where we expect to see development in the near term with high density residential being the driver of redevelopment. Many existing and future roads are shown in yellow to note their importance. And many of them are bordered with a green line denoting a robust landscape buffer to create a better multimodal environment. The most critical roadway shown is uh, this yellow one with the dots in the middle of it, which is meant to act as a sort of main street to facilitate pedestrian friendly uh, commercial corridor with service, retail and dining businesses on the ground floor of residential buildings. The main street would be designed to deter pass through traffic. It would have adjoining programmable open space and it could serve as a festival street. The core area will require appropriately scaled and treated streets with internal through block connections for pedestrians and bicyclists. Residents and visitors will also acquire open space and safe access throughout the area for every mode of travel. And the plan recommends open space to be created underneath the high power transmission lines that crisscross the core area, as Katie mentioned. And these images here are representative of the concepts proposed by the plan. And while the city is grateful for the expanded bus rapid transit service, at the onset of our project, our electeds asked us to conduct a high feasibility light uh, study of light rail um, to create a spur from the nearby Sounder uh, commuter rail in Tukwila. So in addition to assessing the engineering and costs of a light rail spur, we also consider potential challenges and opportunities of each station location as it relates to future development around the Rainier Grady Junction. And while the findings of the study are not definitive and more analysis is needed, we were able to identify three alignments and three potential station locations adjacent to the future transit center, as well as three potential station locations that serving the northern portion of our regional growth center um, by the Southport 
um, and landing developments. So given the looming comprehensive plan update deadline, uh, we were asked to talk a little bit about how we approach sub-area planning in Renton and how the sub-area plans relate to and help inform the comprehensive plan. Uh, so a little bit of background, um, excluding the glossary, our current comp plan is only 92 pages. Uh, prior to the last update, it was over 300 pages, but we reduced the total number just so that we could create a document that's more concise, more readable, and um, one that can serve the purpose as a higher level policy document. Um, other planning documents in Renton, like our community plans or sub area plans, provide a greater detail of area specific goals, uh, policies, and recommendations, and then in turn also more accurately reflect. Uh, the desire of that, of that community. Um, also between our planning documents, we aim for consistency in plan elements. Again, with the primary difference between the two is the sub area plan is able to provide that higher level or greater detail of needs and opportunity. <clears throat> so as Paul mentioned, we adopted the TOD sub area plan just over a year ago, it was last November. Um, here I've included just some of the identified priority next steps, as well as some other items that we've been able to advance in the last year or so, um, and also some items that we're con considering advancing in the near to midterm. Um, as recommended in the plan, we've continued to work with and engage our agency partners to ensure that future improvements, future development in the area align with um, the plan goals. Also, prior to plan adoption, we applied for and received generous funding from the Department of Commerce through one of their uh, TOD implementation grants. Uh, the funding from this grant has allowed us to hire a consultant to work on a plan action ordinance and EIS, which will help catalyze future development. Uh, this is something we actually did 20 years ago, 20 or so years ago, in another area of the city, which we now started to see some of the planning efforts and visioning uh, come to fruition. So we have had um, some success uh, using this tool in the past. Um, also following plan adoption, we've been able to advance some rezones and amend um, some applicable land use regulations so that they are more consistent with the plan's vision. And uh, last year, we were also able to expand the city's multifamily tax exemption area uh, so that we can include that to the entirety of the sub area boundary or the TOD boundary. Um, also, we don't have dedicated right light rail and we don't anticipate that happening in the near term, but we want to ensure that um, we continue to pursue opportunities that we make that would make us a good candidate in the future. So to that end, we will update the plan on final decisions uh, related to the light rail alignment when we're able to uh, pursue further studies. Um, also tax increment financing is a new to Washington financing tool that has potential to spur new private development, which we will consider deploying for this area, uh, which would ideally help cover some of the costs associated with the public improvements. Um, we also have some new development that's already underway, so we'll continue to do what we can to ensure that that new development is consistent with the TOD sub-area plan as we're able to do so. Um, and then lastly, as we discussed, uh, the majority of the TOD sub-area boundary is outside of our regional growth center boundary. Um, so potentially amending our regional growth center boundary would open up opportunities for federal transportation funding, but um, this will be a, something that we'll need to consider for the future and potentially coordinate with uh, Puget Sound Regional Council for guidance. And with that, um, I think we've reached the Q&A portion of the presentation, so I will pass it over to Laura. Great. Thank you, Katie and Paul and Miranda and Juan. Um, so just a reminder to folks, um, you can enter your questions in the Q&A widget. It's at the bottom of the Zoom screen um, where it says Q&A with some little speak bubbles. So feel free to put in some questions. Thank you to Miranda for answering a few, typing in some answers. Appreciate that. Um, 
I think our first question will go to Liz at PSRC. And Liz, can you, you provide some clarity on Vision 2050 and the regional growth strategies goal of 65% of new population growth and 70% of new employment growth um, near high capacity transit and how that connects to regionally designated centers and countywide centers specifically? Yeah, it's a really it's a good question and good clarification. So we do have this region wide goal um, that applies to regional growth centers as well as high capacity transit areas. So I think Maggie kind of defined what we mean by high capacity transit. Uh, we do have two different types of regional centers. We have regional growth centers and manufacturing industrial centers. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, so manufacturing industrial centers are not uh, necessarily included as part of that um, goal because um, they're planning for sort of different types of growth. So this was really sort of more focused on that kind of like a dense mixed use um, type of growth versus like just strictly focused on on employment. So um, it the the goal applies to kind of the all, overall high capacity transit areas. I think what one thing we're seeing with um, our new designation of countywide centers is um, there is a is, there are some overlaps between places that are designated as countywide centers and those high capacity transit stations that are outside of our regional centers. So. Um, Kind of a mouthful, but uh, I think some of the countywide centers um, probably are contributing to that overall 65-75 goal. So hopefully that, that answers it. I'm happy to follow up, though, if you've got more questions. Thank you, Liz. Let's give it another minute or two to see if there are any other questions coming in. Um, I do wanted to acknowledge we got a question asking for um, suggestions on how to encourage transit expansion, specifically in a small city surrounded by rural areas. Um, I think that might be out of the wheelhouse of many of the folks who are speaking, but um, since we don't have other questions coming in, I will throw it out there to see if anyone has any thoughts on that. I don't have a, a thought about that, but I do uh, just wanted to expand a little bit on one of the questions about you know, the relationship with model code and local jurisdiction, you know, this this is not in any way, you know, preemptive authority. Uh, you know, what we're here to do is offer resources. And um, it is interesting to be a grant recipient when you are not actually in charge of the deliverables. Uh, that when we get to the end of this process and locals are adopting policies and regulations, it will be entirely at their discretion. Um, our goal is, is, again, to fulfill that FTE desire for corridor-wide consistency and best practices. And, you know, we're, we're very focused on Linwood, Everett, and Snohomish County. Um, but again, I'm sure the FTA would be thrilled if, if jurisdictions outside of those boundaries also found this to be beneficial. Uh, and Laura, I just wanted to kind of pop in on that question about sort of local transit service. I mean, I think we do view um, comprehensive plan updates as a really great time to help connect with um, local transit agencies and try to understand kind of what their priorities are and um, to help try to shape those into the future. I mean, obviously, transit agencies have a lot of um, uh, demand for service into the future. So um, not not all of those are, are going to be made to the highest priority, but I think this is a really great time to help sort of connect and coordinate um, with uh, local transit providers to understand kind of what they're planning for in the future. Um, I see Katie popped on. Maybe Katie has something to add on this too. I was just going to take a stab at um, answering that one as well. You know, similar to the work that we did with our light rail planning, we front-loaded some of that early the early studies related to that to see if we are a good candidate and so that we can say that we've done some of the early work um, to one, show that we're interested, but you know, to get the ball rolling. And whether or not that works, I don't know, but we're hopeful that we'll be considered a candidate for light rail in the future. Thank you, Katie. Well, I am not seeing any more questions coming through the Q&A widget. Um, a quick reminder to folks that time dependent, we may be able to answer a few more questions at the end of today's session. So if you have other things that come to mind, feel free to throw them in the question and answer widget. Um, but with, oh, one more, thank you. Uh, this is a question for Sound Transit staff. When will the first draft of the, mo the model code be available? 
We are hoping to get the generic package um, published uh, around the May-ish timeframe. Um, so uh, I can put my email address in the chat here if you're interested. Shoot me an email and I'll keep a running list of other folks who might be uh, interested once we once we have that published. Thanks. Thanks, Miranda. Another question. Oh, thank you. My encouragement for folks to add questions is working. This is great. Um, another question. Um, someone was, can anyone speak to any work or thinking that's been done to encourage um, small vendors, specifically food vendors um, in the station areas? Are there any kind of design guidelines or any thought on kind of some of those like micro businesses? I mentioned a couple mm. examples. Um, you know, when you're looking to support small businesses, you know, there's there's kind of what what assistance can you provide to help keep them in their location? Some of that could be funding. Um, there's also making sure that these spaces are places that have a lot of opportunities. So um, incubators is is a kind of a common theme, um, but also just making sure the uses are allowed, making sure. You know that if you have, um, you know, one of our one of our station locations, um, you know, we're we're looking at where it could land, but we're talking a lot about direct and indirect displacement in that conversation, and we'll need to continue that conversation with the community because there's a place that a station could land on top of a of a little strip mall that has, you know, six different languages on the signs. You know, it's, there's a lot of uh, different. Uh, cuisines offered in, in that shopping center. And so we're, we're talking about, you know, is it actually better for those businesses of Sound Transit uh, located there and had to bring to bear all of the resources that happen when you are just directly displaced by a project like this, relocation assistance. Um, if, if the station goes near there and the, none of these tenants own those buildings and the landlord decides to redevelop or raise the rent, those businesses are displaced indirectly um, but they don't have any resources. Um, but also the land use along that road is mostly residential. So they don't have the option to relocate in another area, you know, and still serve that community. So some of it is, is land use tools related to zoning and uses. Some of it is, you know, just making sure uses are allowed like, like food trucks. Um, some of it is, is something that we can work collaboratively with the jurisdictions and the businesses about, like for example, if we did land the station um, in that complex, could we then use some of our surplus property um, or, or you know, something around the edge of the station to create a space for food truck radios? Mm -hmm. So maybe those businesses could still um, serve that community. So there's, there's a variety of tools. Those are some of the first ones that, that come to mind. Thank you, Miranda. Looks like we have one more question, and I think this one will go back to Liz. Um, Liz, can you talk just a little bit more about um, what happens if a city chooses to, um, why are we encouraging cities to plan, um, you know, in coordination with the regional growth strategy and, um, you know, the countywide growth targets? Can you talk a little bit more about that and how the conversation around um, the 65-75% um, growth vision in, re in the regional growth strategy kind of tied it all into that. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's good. There's a lot there's a lot here, but I'll, I'll try to do kind of a quick uh, overview of this. So um, uh, vision includes this regional goal of 65% uh, of population growth, 75% of employment growth. And that's also kind of baked into the regional growth strategy. So our regional growth strategy encourages um, a significant amount of growth in metropolitan core and high capacity transit communities, which are all communities that have uh, or will have high capacity transit in the future. So um, really like kind of our, st our growth strategy is kind of built around this concept. And the, through the countywide process, uh, counties working with cities have designated, have developed uh, growth targets uh, to support their planning for the comprehensive plan updates. Um, so as part of the 2024 updates, we will be uh, looking to uh, reviewing plans to ensure consistency between what plans are planning for and uh, the growth that was assigned in uh, the targets process. Um, I think this question kind of also looks a little bit at kind of the idea of center targets, which I can talk a little bit about in a moment. But, um, you know, we also look at uh, whether um, uh, regional centers are sort of fulfilling their kind of planning obligations. Um, and uh, we will be doing a centers monitoring process 
process, which I'll talk about too. So I think there are kind of, two, depending on kind of like what exactly we're talking about, citywide targets versus uh, center targets, there are a couple different paths in terms of uh, making sure that there's consistency. Um, and certainly uh, certification of uh, your comprehensive plan ensures uh, eligibility for our federal transportation funds. Uh, certification and uh, meeting our center criteria also, if you have a center, also ensures that uh, you're prioritized for our, tra our transportation funding. So um, some kind of important steps there, um, and I can talk more about centers in a minute. Thank you, Liz. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, and I think perhaps this was a great question to end on for this part of the Q&A, because I will pass it over to Liz to talk more about centers. Thank you. Great. Let me pull this up. Um, hopefully everyone can see things. Um, so yes, I am Liz Underwood-Boltman. I'm a principal planner with our growth management team at PSRC. So I am going to talk about planning for centers and uh, talk about uh, mostly about kind of regionally designated centers um, and uh, kind of the, the expectations and requirements we have for um, around planning for centers. Uh, also, we'll touch on uh, if you're considering designating new centers as part of um, your next kind of comprehensive plan update, um, kind of where, where the process sits for that, um, and also touch on a little bit uh, countywide centers, which are a new uh, change from our uh, the last time we updated comp plans. Um, so regional centers are uh, really important, as I've talked about, uh, in terms of our overall uh, Vision 2050 plan, our goals for growth. So regional growth centers are locations of compact pedestrian oriented development with a mix of housing, jobs, retail, services, um, other destinations. Uh, and manufacturing industrial centers are a bit different. So really areas of more regionally significant manufacturing and industrial uses uh, where we're aiming for uh, preserving lands into the future. So I've um, got a map that sort of shows actual boundaries. So compared to um, high capacity transit station areas, these areas tend to be bigger, sort of encompassing of like whole neighborhoods or whole kind of like districts within um, your city. Um, so really important in terms of the overall region's plan for growth. And um, also, as I mentioned, our priority for transportation funding. So um, we're always excited about centers. It's also an exciting time for centers as we consider um, how this fits into your comprehensive plan update. So uh, the biggest change since the 2015-16 comprehensive plans was adoption of our regional centers framework in 2018. Um, so the centers framework um, included a number of different changes um, that are relevant for plan updates, um, including uh, creating a, a classification systems, so two different types of regional centers, so urban centers and metro centers, um, and two different types of manufacturing industrial centers, so employment and growth centers, um, and different sets of criteria for both. Um, really, I mean, one of the overall goals with our centers framework was to try to have a more consistent system where it was clear what everyone was expected to do. Um, and one of those things is around planning requirements. So making sure that plans are adopted, up to date, that are they're um, kind of are meeting the, our expectations around um, summary of planning. So um, really includes a more consistent set of expectations. Um, we also included a minimum set of criteria for countywide centers. I know there's a lot of work that's already happened at the countywide level. So I uh, won't talk so much about that, but um, that's definitely also another option in terms of designating new centers. Um, the criteria also developed uh, an application window for new centers into the future. So um, we will have another window for um, if you're considering applying for a new center designation. Um, so we adopted the centers framework in 2018, um, and it includes uh, include a kind of a guide plan, guide. I'm not going to say the word right, but um, a path to making sure everyone is sort of on the same page and we have with us a consistent set of centers by 2025. So this is really the time to look at um, you know, whether jurisdictions are meeting all the centers, all the requirements, and um, any additional planning you might need to do. Um, so in terms of that timeline, um, so let's just pretend we're already in 2023. I know that seems um, kind of crazy, but uh, we will, of course, through this whole process, be doing some ongoing technical assistance. We're always available if folks have questions, um, and we will be providing some um, updated data and guidance. We have some older data for centers on our website, working on uh, making sure that's updated, um, but certainly you can always uh, request data from us as well. Uh, 2024 comprehensive plans are due, and so this is also just a good time to make sure your comprehensive plan uh, reflects um, any centers that have been designated, any centers that, that you plan to designate into the future, um, and to make sure that that's all kind of like fitting together well in terms of planning for growth. 
Uh, it's also a really good time to make sure any center elements or center sub area plans are consistent and are also reflective of the growth that your jurisdiction is planning for citywide. So I mentioned um, this kind of path to uh, making sure uh, we're all kind of uh, have a consistent and uh, cohesive framework. So we are um, doing a centers monitoring process in 2025 uh, to verify that centers are um, meeting requirements and also have um, have adopted plans that are consistent with our checklist. So uh, we will be working on certifying center plans also in 2025, um, and we'll have this new application window. So it's kind of the trajectory we're on in terms of um, plan updates, uh, and certainly 2025 is feeling a lot more close, a lot closer than it used to be. So um, this is really a good time to start thinking about um, whether there's any additional work that you need to be doing around centers. Um, regional growth centers, um, I've, we've talked a little bit about this, but really uh, we have two different sets of criteria for urban centers as well as metro centers that really focus on um, the existing amount of jobs and housing um, that you have in your community, um, goals around planning for growth and your potential for growth into the future, uh, really trying to support a mix of uses both right now also into the future. Uh, making sure those these these places have quality transit service and are a walkable size and shape. Um, so one of the key differences between regional uh, urban centers and metro centers is the amount of growth that um, they should be planning for. Um, so urban centers are about 45 activity units per acre. Activity units are both people and jobs together. Um, and metro centers are about 85. So we also have just a couple examples here of, it's a little hard to kind of visualize sometimes what that density level means, but um, Redmond Overlake is a little higher than um, the 45 um, activity unit uh, threshold, um, as well as Capitol Hill is a little bit above our 85 threshold, but give you a sense of kind of what some of those existing communities um, look like. On the manufacturing industrial center front, uh, it is a different set of criteria. We look also at um, existing jo total jobs as well as industrial jobs, uh, planning for growth into the future, um, having a freight infrastructure and infrastructure to support manufacturing industrial uses, um, providing a real concentration of industrial land as well as strategies to preserve it into the future. So uh, with our two types of uh, industrial centers, uh, we have uh, industrial growth centers planning for about 10,000 jobs um, and employment centers planning for about 20,000. So we've got kind of some comparables of where some of those um, centers are at uh, right now, uh, if you're trying to sort of visualize what that looks like. Um, so that's just the basic set of criteria. We have, um, of course, the full criteria in our um, the center's framework and are happy to sort of talk through any questions you might have about uh, consistency. Uh, I think what, one thing we're seeing is that um, our center strategy, we've had centers since 1995. Um, so things are really kind of paying off. We've got a lot of growth in centers and we have a lot of um, existing activity. So um, it's a little slightly older data, but in 2019, regional growth centers had uh, 267,000 residents, uh, 687,000 workers, um, all while comprising um, th about 3% of the region's total urban area. So very con concentrated um, uh, areas of employment and housing. Uh, we also, as I mentioned before, expect to have some updated regional growth center data um, in 2023. So um, if, you're, if you're looking for something fresh for your community uh, and we're really seeing a lot of growth um, across the region. Um, if you haven't been to your local regional growth center, um, there's probably been a lot of um, development and activity recently. So uh, we are uh, excited to see the, the growth happening um, in those places. Um, one of the big reasons that we do this work is also that it helps support our goals around climate, our goals around mobility, um, and that's also really borne out in the data. So when we look at our household travel survey data, for example, um, in regional growth centers, we see residents are more likely to walk, take transit, uh, bike than the rest of the region as a whole. Uh, we also see um, across kind of our typology of uh, different types of regional growth centers, uh, shorter trips. So um, you can really see kind of in the data that we have how people are actually getting around that um, a lot of this is really um, reflecting with the goals that we have around uh, mobility and centers. 
Uh, we have uh, a plan review manual that um, includes, hopefully everyone's found their comprehensive plan uh, checklist already, um, but we also have uh, other types of uh, checklists for other types of plans, so including one for regional growth centers, um, as well as manufacturing industrial centers. So um, our checklists are really what we use when we go through and review and certify plans, so um, that really tries to, um, it's, a, it's a great tool if you're looking at scoping some uh, plan updates, or if you have any questions about kind of what we're looking for. Um, if you look at those checklists, we try to highlight things that are new or substantially different from our last, um, the last plan updates or last checklist. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a few of those things when it comes to regional growth centers. Um, certainly there's a much more comprehensive um, checklist, but uh, things that to really think about for this time around, um, looking at um, updated growth targets and making sure you have some, you are reflecting this um, goal about uh, either 45 activity units or 85 activity units per acre, as well as recognition of this regional goal for supporting growth in your um, in centers and near transit. Um, addressing equity, including in terms of uh, engagement with the public, as well as access to opportunity and some other aspects of equity. Um, trying to be more specific about transportation investments um, and projects that um, will help support growth in centers. Uh, we're also working on some updated guidance about um, that work. Um, a more uh, explicit uh, look at coordination, if you've got um, tribes or ports or other special purpose districts trying to be a little bit more explicit about uh, the intergovernmental coordination aspect, um, as well as climate change and environment. Um, housing, I think, is an interesting one because um, a lot of uh, we have a lot of growth planned in regional growth centers in particular, um, and it, it has been a gap that we've seen when we've looked at center plans. Um, so making sure that they address how much housing you have right now, what the need is into the future, um, as well as some of those anti-displacement strategies that we uh, talked about earlier. Uh, also looking also at commercial anti-displacement. I think Maggie mentioned an example from Canyon Park, which I think is a good example from just one of these local sub areas that talk about displacement in the context of commercial. Um, for this particular plan update, you might wanna think about some other considerations as well. Uh, we have some centers that are a little bit too big, some that are pretty small. So looking at overall size and making sure that the boundaries uh, really reflect the planning that um, you wanna do into the future for your community. Um, and for those centers that don't meet the current um, requirements around density, um, completing a market study by 2025. So there aren't too many at, that, at this point that um, don't yet meet the minimum density requirements, but um, there are a few, and this would be the time to uh, make sure that that's part of uh, your scope and um, into the future. Um, here are some recent examples of sub area plans we've seen. So um, the city of Burien um, adopted a plan for their urban center. Um, mentioned, just mentioned Canyon Park. Um, they did a sub area, the city of Basel did a sub area plan for uh, the Canyon Park Regional Growth Center. Um, and back uh, a few years ago, uh, to the Tacoma Mall sub area plan. So we've got some good examples of um, different types of places that have completed some recent work, although we definitely see that center plans take different shapes in different communities. Some of them are uh, much more substantial and include a lot of detail. Um, some of them are uh, really tries to sort of just fit into the context of your local comprehensive plan. So there definitely are some um, some opportunities as long as we're looking at the uh, looking at consistency with our checklist. Um, on manufacturing industrial centers, we're also working on uh, compiling some new data for um, our industrial lands, um, working on some new profiles for our, our manufacturing industrial centers. Um, you can see on these charts here on the right, uh, looking at sort of total amount of jobs overall, as well um, as the um, share of that that is within uh, that are considered industrial jobs. So. What, what type of jobs are we seeing in those places? So uh, we do we are seeing um, a fair bit of growth, particularly in centers um, outside of King County um, as long and um, just some a more steady growth in terms of some of our um, centers in King County, but um, uh, increasing shares of industrial jobs also. So um, that is we will be providing a little bit more data on industrial um, centers, but really important consideration for us as part of this. Um, the Manufacturing Industrial Center Checklist, um, a lot of very similar things, um, although as we just talked about, um, I, I think in, important to include center targets, but it doesn't necessarily need to relate to this regional goal about 65, 75 um, uh, growth overall. 
Um, we're looking at uh, specifically with uh, manufacturing industrial centers, um, looking at this issue about limiting commercial uses. Um, so one of the things we look for are um, this designation of core industrial land. So uh, trying to limit um, commercial uses within industrial zones, um, understanding and considering the role of TOD. Uh, if you have high capacity transit in or near uh, MICs that um, often that development will look different. So, uh, so there's definitely something to consider um, as well as other strategies to limit incompatible uses near industrial areas. Um, and so like regional growth centers, also a really good opportunity to look at size, look at boundaries. Um, and if you're not meeting our existing uh, employment requirements, uh, completing a market study is part of this update. Um, so a couple other recent examples, we have uh, Sumner Pacific, uh, we also have Arlington Marysville, so a couple other uh, good recent plans to, to look at if you're interested. Uh, so when it comes to regional center plans, we've got kind of uh, groups or buckets of what kind of where jurisdictions are at. We have some that were certified very recently, so sort of since 2020, um, and so we generally see that those are meeting a lot of the regional requirements. You might just, if you're in that category, uh, re review the checklist and see if there are any comments in your certification report. Um, other plans were certified sort of after the Vision 2040 checklist, so 2014 or later, um, and some of those plans may have some gaps, and so we really also recommend uh, reviewing the checklist and the certification reports to see if there are um, areas we might want to think about as part of this plan update. We also have some plans that have not yet been certified or have a, a much older certification. Um, and with those, I think many of the many jurisdictions are aware. We've been talking to a lot of jurisdictions, um, but that they may require more significant updates. So um, definitely something to think about and plan ahead. Um, uh, we also, as, as I mentioned, as part of our monitoring process, we'll just be looking overall at consistency with criteria. So um, this is just generally a good opportunity to think about size, boundaries, uh, and whether you might want to complete a market study. Uh, we have definitely some folks that are looking at um, potentially designating a new regional center. So uh, we will have an application period opening in about 2025. Um, and so I just wanted to flag too, as part of our application, we do require a completed sub area plan and market study. So those are both things, of course, you need to plan ahead for, um, as well as uh, there's a process where you need to go through the countywide um, review. So um, that definitely takes some time. So I want to make sure uh, these things are kind of on people's radar if they're definitely if they're considering um, applying for a new regional center in 2025. Um, certainly, we are happy to pull data. Um, about activity units or about employment or industrial jobs, uh, as that would be helpful for your application or consideration at this point. Um, so we have the application, we have the criteria um, on our website if you are interested in that. Um, I also want to talk just briefly about countywide centers. Um, so this was a new designation option um, for the counties um, after the centers framework. And I think it could be a really good option to designate places that um, maybe are a little bit smaller. Maybe you're not quite ready to do the regional center thing. Um, but uh, we, we think there are a number of, of countywide centers that have been designated through the process already. Um, so what, what's happened in most of the counties is um, designation of kind of a, a conditional or a, a provisional list um, that is going to be finalized after the 2024 updates. So if you've got a countywide center that um, you that you put in, into, into the countywide planning policies, this is a good time to make sure your comprehensive plan um, fully reflects um, the boundaries and the planning for that countywide center. Um, well, it also, as Maggie mentioned, we really try to encourage sub area planning just in general. Um, so this is definitely something you could consider um, as part of the countywide process as well. So uh, we think there are a lot of benefits to planning, of course. Um, there are a lot of resources on our website um, that, that I think could help a comprehensive plan update in general, but um, could also just be helpful for uh, looking at regional centers. Uh, we are updating some of our guidance around targets and mode split goals, um, but you can see what's on our website right now. And um, I think the basic framework is helpful in there, but uh, needs a bit, a, a bit of polished updates for some of our, our new policies. Uh, we have uh, map, mapping resources on uh, access to opportunity, displacement, um, other, other resources on planning for equity. Um, our housing innovations program site uh, is really aimed at um, providing more information on housing affordability as well as encouraging density, dense housing types. So it can be a really good resource if you're thinking about planning for regional growth centers. 
Um, on industrial lands, um, there's some there's work happening in terms of updating our industrial lands work. So I think that will be really good regional context, and we'll have some updated data about our manufacturing industrial centers as well. So that was a lot of content, went through it pretty quickly, um, but certainly happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. I think we've got time. Um, yeah, we're also, of course, happy to meet and chat if you've got questions about your own particular um, jur jurisdiction or um, any of the center questions you might have, but happy to happy to ha take any from the group now. Thanks, Liz. It looks like we have one question. Um, where would folks find updated maps of regionally designated centers, specifically if a center um, has changed its boundaries within the past few years? That's a good question. So we have our new, we have a data portal that we launched at the end of the summer that um, includes um, some shapefiles of our existing, um, for existing centers. So if you've got GIS capabilities, you can, um, you can pull uh, down the boundaries from that particular site. Uh, we have also on our site, just a map of regional uh, regional centers that includes some of the boundaries. Uh, if there's one in particular that you're looking at, uh, we can definitely help on that front because there have been some changes in the last few years um, around the center boundaries. Thanks, Liz. I'm not seeing any more questions coming through the Q&A. I think I may hand it back to you and Maggie. Great. Well, if you do have questions, um, we are available. Um, yeah, if you've got questions about this, if you've got questions about other comp plan work, um, please feel free to reach out to plan review at psrc.org. Um, I think we've got one final poll question. Um, Michaela, if you could launch that. Great. So like at the beginning, we're curious to sort of understand kind of how you're feeling, where you're at, um, whether this has been helpful. Um, we've got a few more of these sessions planned, and so we definitely welcome feedback if you've got ideas on how to make these better. Um, and I'm going to leave this up, um, and please feel free to um, give us any thoughts, or you can send us thoughts, of course, later. Um, once the webinar closes, uh, we have um, a survey that will that helps us uh, fulfill some of our Title VI requirements uh, on demographics, so that'll kind of pop up automatically. Um, we appreciate if you're uh, willing to um, provide that information. But I'm going to give this another minute. Great. Well, maybe we can close the poll. We really appreciate having everyone here today. Um, and please feel free to follow up if you have any additional questions. <laughs>